Hey everyone, I want to do some experimenting with heating water with wood stoves. It's a really intriguing idea to me because there's tons of applications. You can use the hot water to store energy from a wood stove that you're already burning, or you could be supplying the house with hot water. You could even heat a house with in-floor heating, and the wood stove could either be inside or outside. You could also be heating water in an off-grid situation for things like showers or small-scale agriculture. And my favorite idea is an off-grid hot tub. So one of the keys is heating the water as efficiently as you can and extracting as much energy as you can out of the flue gases. So in this video, I'm gonna to try to create a really efficient heating coil that can be attached to and used with all sorts of wood stoves. And at the end of the video, I'll test it with a wood stove that I made that turned out really well. It's super efficient. And I'll link the video below where you can watch how I came up with the design and how I built it. And then if all goes well with this heating coil design, in the next video, I'm gonna make a rocket stove so I can attach it to that and do a side by side comparison with a traditional wood stove versus a rocket stove and I'll be able to test different temperatures how long it takes to heat the water how much fuel it uses and from there I can figure out if one design is much better than the other so I'll start with the heating coil design and jump right in just a reminder that likes subscribes and comments really help the channel thanks a lot let's get into the build the first thing I need to do is make the heating coil which I'm going to be using this copper pipe to make and I'm going to need to turn it into a really tight coil so that it fits inside the stove pipe. So it means having a diameter of no more than about six inches. But the copper pipe is gonna be really prone to kinking if I turn it that small. So there's a few things you could do to get around that. And what I'm gonna do is fill it with water and let it freeze. That way, when I go to bend it into the coils, the ice inside should prevent it from kinking. So one thing I have to be really careful of as I fill it with water is that there's no air pockets because it would immediately kink if there was a gap in the ice. So I think if I went to just fill it off of a tap or a hose, there'd be a really high chance of just getting a random air pocket in that doesn't get pushed out with the water as it fills up. So what I'm gonna do is submerge it into this barrel, which has about a foot or 300 mil of water at the bottom. So I'll start lowering it in like this. And as long as I maintain an upward incline with the copper pipe as it crosses beneath the surface level of the water, it'll always be pushing the air up and out. So I'm confident the copper has no air in it now. And I know I'm being pretty anal about this, but the copper pipe is the most expensive part of this project. So I really don't want to mess it up and have to buy a new piece of copper pipe. Next, I'm just going to put two zip ties on it to keep it in a coil. And while it's lying flat at the bottom of the barrel, I'll bend the two ends up so they can't spill any water out. So having the two tails pointing up is preventing any air from getting down into the pipe. And as I freeze it, I'm going to leave the tails pointing up and leave them open so that as the water turns to ice and it expands, there's essentially a pressure relief on each end and a bit of the water can ooze out so that I won't get a burst in the pipe. All the pressure will just come out of the ends. So now I'll go stick this in the freezer overnight and tomorrow I can make the coil. It's been about 24 hours and the copper pipe should be frozen and solid. So I've got this piece of pipe clamped to this table and I've got some big weights to try to immobilize this table. So I'll grab the pipe out of the freezer and try to act really quickly before any melting can really occur. And I'll just stick one end through this clamp here and then just wrap it up down the pipe and hopefully I get a nice tight coil. Okay, so it's the next day, the ice is all melted and I've got most of the water out of the coil and it's time to finish up the coil. So what I wanna do is space out each coil and then make sure that they're all on a consistent slope. I want them spaced so that as the hot air passes over the coil, it can touch all sides of the space. And I also wanna create as much turbulence as I can inside the heat exchanger. So as the hot air is rising up through the flue, it's moving around a lot, it's touching all the different sides of the copper coil. That way it has as much time as possible for the copper coil to absorb the heat from the exhaust gases. So I'm just gonna throw this back on the pipe. So the coil ended up being about two foot long or 600 mil, and I want the heat exchanger to be about four foot long or 1.2 meters. So what I'm gonna do is put about a half inch gap in between each coil and just work my way down and make sure it's nice and uniform and a consistent slope going upwards. So first I'm just gonna use a little scrap of flat bar and I can use that to pry the rings apart. I can just rotate and pry it apart and work my way down. So then I just have a little scrap of wood that I've cut to half inch thick and I can place it between each coil and I can work my way down 
and just subtly adjust each coil so that it's pretty close on half an inch apart. Alright, so the coil is just about done, so I'm going to set it aside and I'll start working on the housing for it. So the coil will be sitting inside of an insulated square housing that will act as part of the flue pipe. I'm going to make the inside layer of that out of this plate and I'm going to make it about an inch bigger than the coil is and have standoffs that hold the coil off half an inch on all sides so that the heat can really swirl all around the copper coil. So I'll get this marked out, cut and bent and start making that housing. Now I'll use a grinder and score these lines so that I can bend them easily. This piece is prepped and ready now. So to make the standoffs, I'm just going to use this thin flat bar and I'm going to make four of them so that each wall of the square housing will have one of these and I'm going to cut a sawtooth pattern into it to match the distance of the coils. So this will just sort of notch into the coil on all four sides and it'll just maintain the shape and keep it centered inside the housing. So first I'll just mark all these out and then get them cut. So that's one done and now I'll knock out the other three. So these are all done now and I can begin to assemble the housing. First thing I'll do is put one bend in the sheet metal. So I'm going to set up my sheet metal brake and get that bend. So now what I need to do is attach one of these down the center of the bottom that the coil can then sit on and both of the tails of the copper will be facing up so they'll be surrounded on three sides by this part of the housing and the tails facing up and out the open side. So I'll place where I want the copper coil to be, I'll line up the standoff to match the coils and get that tacked in. So with that one welded in place, I can go ahead and stick a few magnets to hold the next one in place. And I'll just seat the coil into the grooves of that first one. And then I can drop the second one in so that it lines up with the coil also. And I need to do it like this because the coils are at a slope. So each standoff is going to be slightly off from the previous one because the coils are twisting all the way up. So once I've found the position for this one, I can just pull the coil out and go ahead and weld that one in place. So now I can put the last bend in it here. So I'll take it back over to the sheet metal brake. So I'm just squaring it up now. I'll drop the magnets in just like on the last one, then drop the coil in. And then I can slot the last spacer in. So that's it, and the coil's nice and sturdy and nestled in about half an inch off of each wall. So what I'll do is go ahead and tack it in with the coil still in here, then I'll pull the coil out and finish getting it welded in. So now I'll just double check that the coil still slots in, making sure there was no deformation while I welded it. Okay, so the coil fits in really well to this. So really quick, I'm just gonna go ahead and weld these seams up where I cut them to help bend them. And then I need to start working on the insulation for this piece. So there's gonna be about an inch of high temperature insulation surrounding this whole thing to keep all the heat in so that I'm not losing heat to the outside and the copper has a chance to absorb as much as, as possible. And then the outside will be capped in another sheet of metal just to keep the insulation in and to hold the whole thing together. So this will be a much thinner gauge of steel and I'll just bend the same shape, but an inch bigger in these dimensions and then it'll be just flush across the top. I can pack the insulation around it and then just slot it into that next piece I'm about to make now. So I'll go ahead and get the welding done and form the next sheet of steel. So I have a sheet of thin steel cut to size to form the outer shell and it's marked on where I need to bend it. So I'm just going to throw it in the brake. So that's all done. And so this can just sit inside 
with an inch gap of insulation all the way around. So to get the inside piece to essentially float inside the outer shell, I'm just gonna weld on some bolts and basically use them as standoffs and with some nuts, I'll be able to suspend the outer shell an inch off of this. So I'll do four bolts at each end. So to actually mount the outer shell, I'm just gonna drop it on top of this. Then I'm just gonna get everything lined up and when I'm happy with it, I'm just gonna hit with a hammer, give a blow right on top of the two bolts, and that'll give me a mark on the backside of where to drill the holes. I'll only do one or two at a time because it will shift around with each blow, and they need to line up pretty well. So then I can just drill out the two holes. I'll just use a file to clean up the hole. So next I'll just thread a couple nuts under these bolts. And these are here to prevent this getting too close and to give me that one inch of separation that I want. Then I can drop this on. And with the second pair of nuts, this will be held in place, giving me the inch gap to add the insulation later. So now I'll just go ahead and knock out all these holes. So that's this section finished, and now I just need to do the front piece that will cap the coil inside of this. And I wanna do it in a way that there's no thermal bridging. So other than the bolts, no pieces of metal go from the inside to the outside for heat loss. So it's quite similar to this. It'll be a cap piece that goes over here, some standoffs to keep the coil centered, and then a sheath for the outside. So I have the inner and the outer piece marked out, so I'm just gonna get them cut and ready to bend. Now I'll use four bolts to connect these two the same way I did the others. So now with this piece done, I can grab the other and mate them together. So first I'll just test fit them. Okay, so they fit together all right. So now I can drop the coil in to place the last sawtooth standoff. Okay, with the coil seated in, I can go ahead and mark out the two holes I'll need to drill in this piece to sleeve over the tails right here. And now I'll just test fit the two together. Okay, so this is looking good. They both fit together. The two tails are sticking out. So I'll just stick the last spacer through and line it up. So then I can just tack it in place at the ends, pull it off and get it welded in. Okay, so the coil is firmly held in the center. Everything's fit together. Now to do the end caps. I've marked out all the pieces I'll need for the two end caps on this piece of sheet. I'll get them cut out and then I'll show you the shapes once I do. So there's two of each of these. These are the actual cap. These will be turned into collars and these will be dampers.
So with both end caps finished, the next thing I'm gonna do is add the insulation around here. And a word of caution, any high temp insulation is incredibly toxic, including carcinogenic. Take this stuff really seriously. Mask up, wear glasses, and wash your clothes as soon as you're done working with it. You do not wanna mess around with this stuff. Now I'll just solder on some threaded fittings onto the copper coil. And here I'm just adding some fire rope to seal the gap between the two pieces. So I'll only demask now that I've got it all fully sealed up. I'm gonna clean up and call it for the day, and then tomorrow I'm gonna test it out. All right, so I got everything set up. I've got the heat exchanger on top of the wood stove. I've got a barrel with about 28 gallons of water, that, and I've got an insulated padding wrapped around it. And then that is plumbed in to a pump that's pumping the water through the coil and back into the barrel. The water was about 45 degrees Fahrenheit to start with, and I'm gonna take readings every 10 or 15 minutes and track how long it takes to bring the 28 gallons up to about 100 degrees Fahrenheit, which would be a nice, comfortable hot tub temperature. So I'm about two minutes in, the fire's not even really getting going yet, and the water coming out of the top is already at 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So it really is taking a lot of heat out of the exhaust. And here I've got these probes, and I can take a reading so I'll just let these settle at temperature. So right now the exhaust gases coming out here down at the flue are about 800 degrees Fahrenheit and up here after they've passed through the coil they're at about 250 degrees Fahrenheit. So it really is extracting a lot of heat out of those gases. This is completely cool to the touch. This is 72 degrees. This is barely warm at all. And I'll just mention now the reason that I have a damper at both is because if for some reason the water stopped flowing, I need to protect the copper pipes so I could switch off the damper right here. And that would ideally stop most of the heat going through and protect the copper pipe inside. And the damper at the top is there so that if I wanted to slow the burn down, I could close it off either all the way or partially. The heat would still be rising through the coil and transferring heat to the copper pipe, but I would be able to control the burn from the top and actually create sort of like a heat dome or a heat bell inside of here that's capturing that heat and letting it just soak on the copper pipe. So we're just coming up in 25 minutes now and this thing is cruising way faster than I thought it would. We seem to have settled in at around 1160 degrees here at the bottom, 315 degrees here at the top. It's 118 degree water coming out and it's starting to steam and the barrel is up to 76 degrees. So 40 minutes in and everything's still stable, still got 1100 degrees up at the top. 318 degrees here at the bottom, 122 degrees coming out, and we've got 99.7 degrees in the tub. So I'm gonna call that good. So it took 40 minutes to heat the 28 gallons of water to 100 degrees, which would be a really nice temperature for a hot tub. I added wood once here. I used nine and a quarter pounds of wood to run the fire and it's still got plenty more fuel in there to burn. So I could have either done a smaller fire and had it take a little bit longer, or if I was doing a full hot tub, then I would just keep feeding this and keep heating up the water. But I think a couple hours and I'd have a full hot tub cooking. But overall, this thing is awesome. It's still cold to the touch on the outside. It's still 1100 degrees down here and 315 degrees up at the top. 
it's transferring tons of energy into the water and it's going really fast. I'm super impressed with this, far exceeded my expectations. I thought I'd be out here for a couple hours. It took 40 minutes. So this is really cool. Stay tuned for the next video where I'm gonna build a rocket stove and put it through the same test so I can compare the quantities of wood, the temperatures that they reach, the amount of time it takes to get the water up to temperature. And a system like this, you could do all sorts of things with this. It used barely any fuel. I'm so impressed. This is an awesome day. Uh, I hope you enjoy the video and I'll see you again soon.